Welcome everyone, my name is Simo Sartu. I'm a senior, software, senior principal engineer in, in Red Hat and I work uh, as a team lead for the crypto team. And today I have this presentation about building an open cell provider, <coughs> in this case specifically for PKCS 11. And I'll, I'll just go a little bit of, you know, have a kind of high level overview and then some tips and some lessons learned maybe. <clears throat> Feel free to ask questions anytime. I welcome them. So I'm going through what is the problem, what is a provider, what is PKC11, what is the PKC11 provider, and then how you know what happened when I tried to write one. So the problem is is very simple. It's not a new problem actually. In you know in previous open source version, there's a thing called engines, and there was an engine that allowed you to use PKC11. So the problem was specifically with the new version of OpenSL3, which deprecated engines and introduced this concept of providers. And the problem is having an application that is using the OpenSL API ends up being able to use a hardware token generally or even a software token that does some cryptographic operation. So what is a provider and why there is this change? So OpenSL uh, had these engines, but there were limitations. Some, some, sometimes it'll be awkward to use in applications and Providers are kind of better engines, if you want, uh, from an application point of view. Um, they can be transparent to applications, unlike engines where, where there was a requirement that the application know how to use them and call specific APIs. Uh, there are already, in fact, multiple providers within OpenSL3 that applications don't really actually see, They're like the default one, FIPS, legacy, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so it doesn't, it does not require for an application to explicitly select a provider. Um, it can be, uh, for example, configured in, 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 in OpenSSL conf file and, you know, transparently or uh, loaded. And it, you can also set properties in, in, for a provider that kind of can change the behavior of OpenSSL to use a provider or to change the behavior of a provider. So it, it basically allows uh, uh, a good configuration or uh, agility, if you want, in the way cryptography is used once an application you know, uses OpenSSL, which was not really available before it, I would say. At the code level, it's just a loadable mod module, like a shared library. So in, in OpenSSL.conf, you will define, I have this provider, this is the name, and OpenSSL can load this shared object, find you know, functions and, and mm -hmm. use various uh, management functions uh, you have to implement generally at least uh, at least a key management uh, op operations because you know when you're doing cryptography you usually are using keys, even though technically there are some some operations that OpenSSL can do that doesn't involve keys. Those are not very very interesting to me at least. Um, and you also need to support at least a way to reference these keys later in other operations through OpenSSL. Uh, but but that's uh, that's you know that's about it. It's just a self self contained shared object that can do operations that OpenSSL can call into. And this is taken directly from the old OpenSSL 3.0 design, just to show you the difference in terms of where these things lives. In, in, in the engine is some sort of legacy thing that kind of has its own world around it, while the provider is really below the core of the library today. So it's really, really hidden and very, very, very low level, if you want. And all of the providers are basically on the same uh, level, and while the engine was a special thing, uh, together with many other special things. So that's why the provider can be used somewhat transparently, uh, while engines really had to be coded specifically for. All right, so what is the difference when an application had to use engines before and now needs to use providers? Uh, as you can see on the left side with engines, you will see a lot of this engine word, like you have to load the engine, you need to know what the engine is, what the name is, and then you need to use a, spe a special operation to load a key from an engine, and then you do the normal operations, and then you know, close and go away. But the critical part is that you really have to change your application to use that, these, these functions. On the provider side is that if you use the modern OpenSL API, you just open a store, which can be anything, even normal file, so you can have an application that just doesn't know anything about your provider. And then you will load from the story key. Again, there is no special knowledge of where this key is coming from, what it is. 
then you will do your operation and close. So in terms of the amount of code, it's kind of comparable, but the good thing is that if you look down the URI, which is the only identifier that differs uh, if all goes well, uh, that usually comes not even from the application directly, it comes from some configuration file or maybe some prompting if it's a command line utility. And so it can be totally uh, transparent to the application itself. So if the application is well written, you can test with pen files for keys and then you, you bring in your provider that has the keys completely different place and the application will just keep working fine and doesn't know anything. So from the point of view of architecting and working in an application, it makes it much easier to plug in, you know, modules that will do new things without having to constantly write patch, you know, send bugs to many applications. Of course, this is not, this doesn't work backwards in time, so it's for new applications that will use the new API, but that's okay, I think. Okay, so what are available providers? Besides the internal ones, there are a few good pointers in this uh, GitHub um, project. There are two that I consider notable because I use them a lot to learn how an external provider should behave. One is the TPM2 op OpenSSL provider. It's a provider that gives you access to TPM, so you can use basically the TPM directly from OpenSSL. And the OQS provider, which is the provider that uses LibOQS, which implement quantum safe algorithms. Both those providers were already quite well written, I would say, in terms of the number of operations they were doing. Not, I'm not making a code quality statement, but just in, in, the, in you know, the, ex the extent of the APIs they were using, and they were very useful to learn more about the providers before I ventured in writing this other one. So let's then digress now a little bit. What is PKC11 before we go there? So you need to know, understand a little bit what it is to, to figure out why or what I did. Uh, and so PKC11 is fundamentally an API, so a C API specifically, and what it does is kind of mediate the, the access from an application that is more generic to hardware, generic hardware token like an HSM, a smart card, the YubiKey, whatever you have. Um, so it's very simple in concept, and the standard is, is managed by the Oasis group, um, and it really only defines how an application talks to a, a shared module fundamentally. It doesn't implement or define any hardware protocol. How that driver talks to the actual hardware is completely outside of the scope. And it basically creates a, a, an abstraction layer of you know, potential hardware communication, but it doesn't have anything to do with hardware. That, that's kind of important because it means that you really need to have yet another piece of software underneath. It, you know, it's not just calling and talking directly to some hardware. And um, it, it, the other thing is that it's not like a monolithic thing. There are many APIs defined in PKC11, but not all of the hardware, not all of the drivers implement all of them. So that also means you need to be a little bit careful of what you're gonna use because maybe one hardware token with its driver will support that API and another will not and things like that. So it, it is a kind of like a collection of API if you want in a sense, rather than a, a solid you know, thing that you can just write something, test, and it will work everywhere. So it, it, it really inherits <laughs> the hardware limitation if you want in some sense. And it continues to evolve as new uh, you know, cryptographic primitives or new protocols or new algorithms are being created. So now we can tell it what is the PKC provider. It's just, you know, getting this API and sticking it into OpenSSL with a middle layer that translate the way OpenSSL under, you know, created the provider's API and talks to the driver that you want to use for whatever hardware you have. And so it just, you know, another abstraction layer in the middle somewhere and eventually you go and talk to hardware or a software token or whatever it is. And it is at that um, address there on GitHub. So what are the goals for the PKC7 provider? Uh, the main goal for me was, of course, to make it possible to use PKC11 tokens with OpenSL3 because the engine uh, interface uh, is rapidly kind of degrading its ability to, do, to work well uh, due to the deprecation. Uh, 
And I, you know, we wanted to look forward and see what use the native, you know, APIs for open cells that eventually we can stop using these deprecated interfaces. Uh, but the thing that really uh, intrigued me and interested me was the fact that if used correctly, it, it can be completely transparent to our application. Um, so one of the things that made very hard, in my opinion, use uh, hardware tokens was that whenever you want to use a hardware token, you had to go to the application developer and ask, you know, can you start using this engine API in this specific, in this special case, for me to use this token? So you had to go and change applications. Uh, while with the providers, there is a good chance that, you know, you can actually send patches to change how the application works, but it's not a special case, it's just a common case. And, you know, depending on how you configure OpenCell, then you will use either the, the standard cryptography within OpenCell or the provider. Um, the other thing is that you can use the standard uh, PKC11 URIs to define how to get access to a key. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, well done, I think, standard in this case. It gives you all the tools and tweaks you need to identify a key in a token so that you can uniquely identify the key and pull it when needed and use it and, you know, I haven't felt any need to do anything else, so I think it, it's complete from that point of view. Um, the other thing I wanted to do uh, is that I would like to get to a point where we can configure PKC11 provider in a, in a system like Fedora or RHEL by default as a standard provider in the default configuration and yet not have side effects in applications that are undesirable unless the application is actually using the provider and then in the case it will not be a side effect, it will be wanted. And, um, you know, of course then that's also the, the case where applications want to explicitly force the use for, for the provider. In that case they will use a property like provider equal PKCS11, but that just need to work. And the, the final goal was to make it uh, work with as many actual hardware tokens as possible. Because as I said, many you know, of these tokens just support a subset of, subset of algorithms, sub subset of uh, functions. Sometimes uh, they have quirks where they kind of support something but not in the correct way and, and many other strange things because hardware is, you know, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes. Um, and also software tokens. So these are the goals. Uh, for the project. Um, so how we can use it, uh, I'm not going really down in details and give you an exact configuration that can be easily found you know, online. But fundamentally it's just a little snippet of configuration in the main open cell configuration file. What you need to define is where the module is, where you compiled it. Uh, you need to define what driver, what PCS11 driver you want to use. You might want to define a pin because normally uh, what happens with hardware tokens is that you have to have a pin to unlock the token to permit operations. Uh, it's not required to set a pin in the configuration. Uh, there is support for prompting if what you're doing is, for example, using open cell commands and you have an interactive section. So you can avoid that, but generally, you, you know, like for services running on some server, some machine, you're okay setting the pin in that configuration so that machine can access the token uh, directly without having to do uh, any, any you know, dance around introducing the pin and keeping it in memory or whatever. But that's up to, to the users. And then you can run a command like the one that you see there, open cell store util keys, text because still available to test the configuration and you should see something like this where it will uh, connect to the token if there is a pin needed and it's configured, it will use it. Otherwise, it will prompt you for a pin. Um, and then it will fetch the objects from the token and then print them out because of the dash text uh, option. What, it, what, what we print out, we implement an encoders and decoders explicitly to print a little bit more information than what normally open cell prints when it, it pulls keys. And what we print is, for example, the URI, uh, the case is a URI that you could use if you want to use that key you just found. Like if you have a token, uh, you generated some, you know, some key with maybe some UV key utility, whatever not, you have, you have the like, how do I find now this key that I want to use in the application? You just use this command. It will list all the keys you have. You find the key you like and 
you just can use that URI in the configuration <laughs> to use that. Wow. <laughs> um, so in this case, I found 12 keys and I just, you know, alighted something to put in the screen, but it will print for everyone a URI and, you know, the public key and a bunch of information. All right. So, in order to get there, I had to learn how to write a provider. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an interesting, an interest, I mean, I like, I like doing that, I have to be honest. I really loved having to dig <laughs> into the code, but it is a little bit of a daunting proposition because the documentation is really sparse. Like, if you do man 7 provider, you get some information, but you won't go very far in, what, in, in the terms of what it really means to actually write a writer. It's mostly about how you use it or stuff like that. It's very generic. Uh, so um, you end up reading a lot of sources. And there are, you know, two things to know. Uh, there is the open cell source, of course. So you read that, uh, it will give you a lot of hints. Uh, although internal providers take shortcuts, even just in the initialization code, when I started, I was looking at those like, this won't work in my own. And so what you end up doing is probably reading also external provider sources to figure out the difference or the things you have to do when the module is built outside of OpenSSL. Um, the thing that makes things hard for real, more than actually reading the source per se, is that OpenSSL has an extreme level of indirection everywhere and very, very hard to read multiply nested macros everywhere. So sometimes reading the source code leaves you more confused than, than not reading it. And when that happens, I shell out GDB, I set you know, my, you know, my breakpoints and just go and see what happens. Maybe I do backtraces and then I go back and try to find the functions with the understanding of where things are coming from, where they're going, then, then you have a, a better idea. But Sometimes GDB also get confused because of the extreme level of macro interaction. And so, you know, it's, it, it's fun in a way. Sometimes you swear a little bit, but in, well, in the end, you know, it works. Um, so the first hurdle I had was initialization, but actually from that point of view is once you know the thing, it's kind of easy. You know, the only thing that you have exposed for your share object is basically just one function. That makes it easy. It's just this, this function called OSL provider in it. It's all you need. Done. You can go. <laughs> well, this function will return a thing called a dispatch table, which is a, a function table that points multiple functions. And one of them, which is kind of the most important one, is the one that you know, allow you to query for operations, which basically will tell OSL what operations the provider actually can do, can support. And that will return, each of them will return back another function table. <laughs> that then OpenSell will kind of cache and use at some point to do whatever operation you need to do. So for example, you can implement this OSL OAP signature function table with a bunch of things. But if you do that, then you will also need to do a few more because OpenSell kind of expect that for some operation that you must have other operation also working, although, you know, Technically, you could just implement you know, that, that single operation in there are side effects. So you end up you know, having to build other operations, but it, it is okay, it's doable. So what are operations, just to be clear? Like, for example, if you want to implement your own RSA version for whatever reason, you know, for fun, because you have a special hardware module, or a special CPU structure you want to use, you just want to do some different code. Uh, you will have to get, ha have a name recognized or not recognized by OpenSSL. To be clear. So like if you use a name that is recognized like RSA, it means that OpenSSL open can use your provider also when the application just generically asks for RSA. And, but if you implement something like a quantum safe algorithm, you will have different names that OpenSSL doesn't necessarily know ahead of time. Uh, anyway, there is a name that identi identify, you know, beyond the operation type, what kind of cryptographic uh, algorithm we are implementing fundamentally. And then you will have to provide constructors, destructors, get and set parameters. These are almost all of these operations have some kind of stuff like that. And then you will implement your specific you know, function. Like for example, if we want to implement signatures, you will have something like 
I'm implementing the OSL func signature digest type in it, which is in this function table, you have this thing defined and then a function that will implement this operation. And then of course you will have update and finalize and whatever now. And verify, verify edit, verify update, verify finalize. So this is what a function table kind of looks like, at least in my code. And here you can see that I fell in the same trap of using macros. <laughs> so it's not actually <laughs> a real C structure in this form, but this makes it more readable. So I, in the end, it was, it was okay. And I, I picked this as an example because it's one of the shortest uh, signature structure because the DDSA doesn't support various things. So you basically have three functions that create free or duplicate a context. A context keeps uh, various information on what kind of operation you're gonna do. Then you have at the bottom uh, a way to get and set parameters. You could maybe setting a digest that you want to use for a signature or other parameters needed. And then you have the actual sign and verify functions. And this is all that you need to implement to basically do EDDSA uh, in open cell. All right, so then there is key retrieval and key management. Usually to do anything useful, like it, unless you're just re-implementing an existing thing just in a slightly different way, uh, and specifically in the PKC 11 provider where keys are not directly available because the whole point of hardware modules is that the key is stored safely in hardware and so it cannot be extracted and used in software. You have a way to go and find this key or reference them somehow so that later when you do an operation you will use the key you want. So, and the API to use uh, to find keys or load keys is the uh, OSL op store API. It just defines ways to load keys, find keys, and you know, unlock keys through password and callbacks and stuff like that. And also importing and exporting keys, which might also need another one, which is the encoder uh, operations in case you actually need to then use ASM1 to either export them in some form format or import them and, and, and so on and so forth. And finally, you also need the key management. Like these three kind of always work kind of together somehow. And key management does things like um, generating keys or preparing keys for operations and various things like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going into details because you know, you'll never end, but just to give you an overview of the individual areas that you need to learn over time to be able to be, build a complete provider. So this is how once you build enough things, <laughs> things will start to kind of work finally. So if you have an application you, and you want to do a signature operation, you have basically two basic operations you have to do. First, you have to get a key, and then you will have to have your, sign, your data, and you will say, I want to sign this data. So to get, could I get a key? In the PKC11 case, you have this URI, They'll call OpenSL with the open store uh, API and say, I want to find a key with this URI. Then OpenSL will see that it's PKC11 column and say, oh, I have a provider that can handle this kind of URI. And so it will go into the PKC11 provider. There are various things I'm not going into, but it will find what operation it can do. And eventually we'll find that there is a store facility there, we'll call it. And the provider will actually then know that there is a URI I'm looking for. So it, it will go down into the driver for PKC11 and try to find if there is a key that basically fulfill all the filters you have in this URI. And if it finds it, it will return back, it will cache something in some memory object store, return a reference to OpenSL, and if OpenSL finally will create this EVP P key structure that gives back to the application. And that's the abstraction that basically allows the application to reference a key, whether it was stored in a file or in PKC11 or TMP or whatever it is. And then the next thing the application does is like, I finally have a key, I have my data, I want to sign it. It will send the, all this stuff down to OpenSL, which will send it down to the PKC11 provider. PKC11 provider says, oh, I got this key, there's a reference, I know what the handle is. For the PKC XML layer, I can set up the operation with the hardware. I can tell the hardware, this is the operation I want to do, this is the key object that I want to use, this is the digest I want to use, whatever. It will call the driver, the driver will do its own set of things. Eventually, you get back 
a binary blob, which is a signature, you will send it up. In some cases, the PHRW provider might have to message this data because of some time, in, for some signature cases like ECC, I think, um, PKCC level will return, you know, the data in some format, open a cell, we expect a slightly different one, so maybe there's some, some play with it, but eventually it will come back to the application and you have your signature. Uh, from the point of view of the application, the application just called open a cell to do a signature. The, everything under the first layer is completely uh, unknown, potentially, by the application. And I think that's the, the nice part. So what are the hard areas? I had my head on multiple times. Uh, encoders and decoders. Uh, the concept is very simple, but you have to know about the ASIN one, for example. All of the providers, the internal ones and the external ones, use at least five layers of nested macros to implement the functions that implement these encoders. So when I was trying to understand what was happening, it was really, really hard. The GDB was completely useless uh, to follow what was going on, and I just went trial and error until things worked. And eventually, I understood enough to actually correct the, f the, f the first, uh, the, the few mistakes I had. And it kind of works, but it is really, really difficult uh, code. And then there is a naming and caching resolution within OpenSL itself, because whenever OpenSL tries to do an operation and tries to find which providers can complete that operation, like for example RSA, it has a, a whole world where it looks for names and try to find them and cache stuff, find function pointers. I, I gave up on that one because every time I had, you know, I was trying to look into it, the code is really complicated, but I was also trying to solve another problem and the other problem was more important. So maybe it's just me, but I just say, keep it on faith. I mean, it works most of the time. Sometimes like, you know, I ended up, you know, just looking at other code, what it's doing. Okay, maybe I'm doing something wrong when it wasn't working, but you can largely mostly ignore it, but it is a really complicated code. Uh, maybe it would be nice to have a guide on that uh, from the open source side. But it's, it's not a showstopper. Uh, but those are really hard areas where it's really hard to understand what, what, what you're supposed to do and how things work. There's still one thing that I not understand, maybe I'll ask the pencil developers one day, uh, about the query operation for the function that is a query operation where you can return a result that says, don't cache this. And if you do that, what happens is kind of the, the opposite, like OpenSell will only use that thing for their own, and it's like, what? <laughs> so I stopped doing that. But yeah, I mean, it was fun. So what are the next steps for me, or for, for the project in general is uh, integrating with applications because as I said, you know, you have to use the OpenSL 3 API fully to make use of, of the providers. So we did some testing within the team with LibSSH. Uh, stuff mostly works if some bugs were found, uh, but that, that should, should be, we should be able to get that working. But I want to work on ISC bind, OpenSSH and model cell to make them use uh, this instead of engines, and that's where we'll go next. And, you know, a lot of bugs were found in the making of these slides, but nobody was hurt. <laughs> there, were, uh, there were PRs open, there were discussion upstream, open and sell developers were mostly very, very gracious and useful and understanding and accommodating, and we fixed things, we had PR going, changes. There are still some things discussing. Uh, there are still some areas where the provider API can be improved to make things easier or possible. But overall, it has been a very fun experience for me. So, yeah, thank you all. And if you have any questions. Yep, go ahead. And I wonder, 
Yeah, yeah. So the question is, in, 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 in FIPS model, when you want to use a FIPS provider, there are two providers you actually have to configure. One is called the base provider, and the other is the FIPS provider. And the base provider does encoding and decoding, the FIPS provider does the encryption primitives and how that works. So one thing that I maybe I, I didn't say is that although there is this impression that the provider is monolithic, like it says one thing, from the point of view of OpenSL, each provider fundamentally gives you a palette of providers to choose from. Like each operation is kind of its own provider within the provider. So, and each one of them has a name and a function table associated. So when OpenSL needs to do an operation, like I need to decode something, it will query all of the providers, or well, it's more complicated than that, but let's say it, it queries all of the providers and will find which providers tells back to OpenSL, I can handle this, okay? And then it will, OpenSL has some logic to choose which of the providers it will use. So in the case of the base versus FIPS provider, the FIPS provider doesn't provide any encoder or decoder function. So whenever OpenSL asks who can decode this PEM file, the FIPS provider will not respond, but the base provider will say, I can decode this. And that's how OpenSL knows that it will use with the base provider for that. What is more complicated is what happens when one provider, for example, decodes the key and then you want to use it another provider. But I don't go there unless you ask for it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, so it seems like the important thing when we need to port the applications is to switch to using this OSSL store. Um, how do we get then the automatic association between using a specific um, provider for, say, say if I've got a PKC as a URI for my user, how do I know to use your provider for that URI versus some other provider which might be on the system? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if applications reach to this new OpenSL store API, which is what is needed to use provider, and passes in a URI, how does OpenSL know that it has to use the PKC11 provider versus another provider, and stuff like that? There are multiple ways in, uh, that are implemented to influence which provider is being used. So, first of all, uh, providers can uh, register into an OpenSL a handler for URIs. And so the PKC11 provider registers into OpenSL, I can handle anything that is PKC11 column something, okay? So whenever OpenSL is given a URI in the store uh, case, it will see, oh, it's not file column or slash because there, there's a shorthand there. It's PKC11 column, so which provider handles this? It will find that the PKC11 provider handles it and it will call the store operations in the web provider. Now, what happens after that is that uh, the PKC11 provider will return, you know, an object reference for a key, for example, and in once you will, and that will be, you know, embedded into this EVP key structure. When you do an operation with the EVP key structure, then OpenSell will go in and look into it and say, oh, this key is owned by this provider. Let's try to see if this specific provider can handle the operation I'm being asked to, to do. And if it does, it will prefer to use that provider. And if that provider does not support the operation, what OpenSL does is it, uh, it will ask the provider, can you actually export this key so I can actually import it in another provider and use it in another provider? So this is the general mechanism. But you have things like pro properties, for example, to tell uh, OpenSL, well, you should really only ever use providers that expose this property and never anything else, even if they say they support operation. This is how, for example, the FIPS provider is actually really used because the FIPS provider is fundamentally the same code base as the default provider. The difference is that when you set the property called FIPS equal yes, then OpenSL will only use the provider that exposes this property, which is the FIPS provider. So. There is this selection mechanism within OpenSL that either the application can pass in or the configuration can uh, file can be set to that allows you to select specific providers when multiple of them offer the same functionality. That, that's how it works in, in a nutshell. Yep. I wanted a little more about the PCSLN module. Um, can I do that with standards or does that need, will need to or will the PKC selection provider have to know I'm loading on from a module when I'm managing it? So the question is... Uh, I, want, I want to 
Okay, so the question is kind of a lot more than one. Are you, are you, well, the question is kind of a lot more, more than one pixel 11 module. Uh, my question to you, do you mean more, the, more pixel 11 drivers? Yes. Okay, so because you know, the pixel 11 provider is kind of a module itself, which get loaded dynamically into open a cell if there is configuration. And, and then uh, the provider itself currently loads one driver. So if you want to use multiple tokens, uh, there are multiple strategies that you can go for. Uh, one is different applications use multi different tokens, so you will have a custom opencell.conf file for each application, and in each one you will set the driver. Or you set an environment variable instead of setting the driver into the configuration, and you set this environment variable for start the application. But that's another way we support to load different drivers, and that's what we use, for example, in CI when we test different uh, drivers. Um, or you use something like B11Kit that can aggregate multiple driver underneath. It's a basically called proxy information there. So there isn't a single way to go. It will depend on the situation and what you need to use and how you need to use it. So, yeah. I, I have never tested whether I can load the same provider in OpenSL multiple times. So it but I haven't really looked at that. This is actually the same provider multiple times, but we will give strange effects. Yeah. This is actually the code that is the load by the model of the kit proxy, which basically aggregates all the pieces that are installed in the PLM kit. So it does not provide configuration configuration file pass to our specific cases of module in the load cases of PLM kit proxy that will basically do what you want. Yeah, Jakub commented that. We have, a diff we have a build option where we will load by default the P11 kit uh, proxy, which can collate multiple drivers available in the system by doing some discovery, and so it will make multiple drivers available. And this works just fine because through the PKC11 URI, you can always select specific module you want to use, even if multiple modules have keys that are named the same way. So there's no ambiguity unless you we, yeah, unless you forget to set those parts, <laughs> but yes. It, it's possible in the end to have multiple PKC11 modules loaded at the same time. We're out of time, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>